Hey, listen, uh, welcome to church. If, if you're part of the faith family, you know we are in the midst of a series going through the book of... Oh, some of y'all are paying attention. Going through the book of Psalms, uh, and we have coined this ancient songs for modern people. Now, now, if you're unfamiliar, if you're investigating God, faith, or spirituality, we're thrilled you're here, by the way, with us this morning. The book of Psalms is a collection of, of, of almost, I would call it, a musical journal of various artists throughout the Bible. Uh, predominantly, it is written by King David, the patriarch, but there's other guys that have written stuff. And, and so they're, they're sort of really honestly, in very raw, real, and vulnerable ways, committing their highs and lows on paper to God, and it happened to get published in the best-selling book of all time. How many of you would be thrilled if that happened with your journal, right? That'd be awesome. And so the, the, the Psalms is a really unique, beautiful, interesting window into some of the heroes of our faith, how they react and respond to real life. And so we're going to jump back into this this morning. Are you guys ready for this? All right, if you're physically able, would you stand to your feet as we read and honor God's word together? We're going to be in Psalm 39. If you have your Bible and you want to turn there, we're going to be in Psalm 39. If you don't have a Bible, no sweat. We've got it up here on the big old sky Bible for your viewing pleasure. Anyone become a shark expert this week? Anybody? One time, you know what I'm talking about. Shark week. It's a beautiful thing. And now I'm terrified to go to the beach. But that's not the point. Psalm 39, here we go. Are you ready for this? Say, let's do this. All right, Psalm 39. This is a psalm of David to the choir master. He says this, I said, I will guard my ways. Matter of fact, why don't you say that with me? I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle. He was not playing around. So long as the wicked are in my presence, I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. You ever been there? You're like, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going ah. You ever been there? It's like, man, I tried. David says, I tried to hold my tongue. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Oh, Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not even know who will gather it. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Would you join me in prayer, Jesus, in these brief few moments that we share together this morning? I'm asking that this would be more than natural articulation. Would you speak to us powerfully through your word? And if you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five. You can find your seat. Tell him, here we go. Here we go. I want to begin this morning with a little blast from the past for all of you 80s and 90s kids. I'm hoping you recognize this clip. Why don't you go ahead and play this for me, guys? Was that the end of the clip? Deja vu. Hit the lights. Somebody wants a movie theater in here. You can hit the mains. <laughs> Y'all are too much. been there before? Run, run, oh, yeah. Rudolph, Randolph ain't too far behind. Run, run, Rudolph, Santa's got to make it to town. Santa make him hurry, tell him he can take the freeway down. Run, run, Rudolph, kneeling like a merry-go-round. Hold the play. Did we miss the flight? No, you just made it. Yeah! Woo! 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 Woo
Oh, to take whatever's free. Okay. Yeah. 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 I can I'm wait for I'm reeling like a merry-go-round. Kevin! <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. You can flip the lights back on. Hey, can anyone name this film for me? Anybody? Home Alone. For those of you that are too young, you need to go back and check this out, all right? You're missing a classic. Home Alone is the story of a family much like yours and ours who just happens to leave their young adolescent child home alone when they go on a trip to New York and all sorts of calamities ensue, uh, coined by the iconic phrase, iconic phrase, Kevin, which is ironically what we yell in our staff team all the time. Um, love you, Kevin. Thanks for editing that video for me. But, but I thought about this clip. Now, now, this is crazy to me. In the midst of this clip, you hear the parents utter what I believe to be inconceivable phrases in our modern age. They say this, oh, no, the plane leaves in 45 minutes. Now, how many of you, if you know the plane left in 45 minutes, what are you going to do? Nothing. You're going to sit at home because if the plane leaves in 45 minutes, it already started boarding, and you just might as well go ahead and know there's no way you just missed your flight. Now, this is crazy to me because, I mean, if you want to take a flight now, you're like, okay, we got an 11 a.m. flight. Okay, so if we leave at like 2 in the morning, we should be good to get to the airport and make it through customs and make it through. You know, it's just like, it's crazy. Like, I can't even imagine. There was a day and age, young people, listen to me, where you could just like show up and get on a plane and travel. It was amazing. What happened? 9 11 happened. Tragedy struck, and, and so what happened is that culture, whereas something in the past had been acceptable, culture now demanded as a result of tragedy that we needed to better guard our people. We needed to better guard our airports. We needed to better guard our security, and so everything in an entire industry changed. See, when bad things happen, we begin to guard our ways. Because that's what you do when, when something goes wrong and when barriers are breached. You fortify the weak link to ensure that it doesn't happen again, right? We say things like, man, if, if we would have just had a little bit better security, if we would have just been a little bit better on top of things, we could have avoided this calamity. Because hindsight is always 2020. Because looking in the rearview mirror, we always see it so clear. How did we not get this before? See, we always have the answer after we got it wrong the first time. After we've experienced the pain of the first time. After we've experienced the heartache and the tragedy of the first time. We always guard our ways once we realize they didn't work the first time. That's, that's just kind of a no-brainer. But see, this, this message this morning is on my heart in such a major way. Not just because I haven't preached for three weeks, so you better be ready for an hour and a half long sermon. Some of y'all laugh. No, I'm just playing. I'm not going to preach that long. But this matters so significantly this morning because we live in a world of adversity. We live in a world of danger. We live in a world of pitfalls and booby traps at every corner. And I'm not just talking about physically when it comes to terrorism. I'm talking about in every aspect of life, holistically, emotionally, spiritually. We live in a world where the norm is divorce. We live in a world where the norm is adultery and emotional affairs and actual affairs. We live in the world where the norm is, man, my kids don't want anything to do with me anymore. We live in a world of fragmented, disjointed, broken relationships. And the people that aren't on guard, that don't have good guards, end up in the gutter with no idea how it even happened. Shipwrecked families, shipwrecked lives, shipwrecked career, wasted lives. And the thought reverberating through their head is, man, how did I even get here? And it's a tragedy. This is one of the tragic realities. See, we, we look back and, and in, in, in sort of the wake of some sort of a massive train wreck in your life for your career or your family, the, the question when we see these broken relationships is always, how did this happen? And my question on the floor for this morning is, what if there was a way to avoid all of that before it happened? What if there was a way to ensure that you didn't actually have to lose everything before you finally 
got it right? What if there was a way to live your life that ensures that even if you made mistakes and blew it in the past, you do not have to let that happen ever again? Would you want to know it? Come on, Zar. See, the answer lies in the ability to guard your life. And so this morning, I want to dive into this together. I want to talk about how to guard yourself and your family and your career and your heart and your life in a way that can stop those meltdowns before they even happen because I think God is smart and he let David in on a secret. This morning, this sermon is about wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Say it like you mean it. Say wisdom. wisdom. This sermon is a wisdom sermon it's about the wisdom of guarding your life. I've got one core idea for the morning. My, my big premise for the morning is this, guard your life. Turn to a neighbor and say, you gotta guard your life. Guard your life. All the introverts are loving me right now. See, often the church has a vision for offense, but we have no defense, which is fine unless you have an opponent. And we do and he's actually pretty smart. And so what happens is a lot of us in this room, I'm hoping during the course of this series, have gotten on the right track. We've gotten on the right path like it talks about in Psalm 1, the path of blessing. And if you are on that path, I am so thrilled. Can I let you know you need to guard it? And if you're in a good spot, you need to guard it. And if your family is in a good place, you need to guard it. And if you or God are doing great and you're just levitating out of your bed every single morning, that's amazing, you need to guard it. Because this life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I want and God wants us to survive and thrive for the long haul and ultimately to finish our race as well. Do you want that, church? Amen, so do I. So let's dive into the wisdom together found in Psalm 39. I've got three stopping points along the way. If you want to endeavor to guard your life, the first one is you need to guard your words. Everybody write that one down if you're taking notes. The first step is to guard your words. Y'all were way too silent on that one. It's like it just hit everybody you're like, ooh. Guard your words. Anybody have a difficult time with this one? Yeah, okay. Some of y'all are being honest. The rest of you, you have a difficult time with lying. That's okay, though. God will forgive you. Psalm 39, 1, David says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I don't know about the rest of you, but, but I uh, frequently, I don't know how this happens, find myself in moments where something is coming out of my mouth, and I'm like, oh, the words are coming out. Oh, my gosh. And I'm, you're trying to get them back in, and it's just not happening. And you ever been in a conversation? You ever been in a situation, and in your mind, you're thinking something, and you're like, don't say it. Don't say it. And then all of a sudden, the words are magic. You ever, anybody ever been there? Y'all make your pastor feel a little bit better. You ever been on a date and done that before? I remember it was, uh, my, my wife Nancy and I have a son, his name is Liam, he's 18 months old, and my wife is just amazing, like I married the Boricua beauty, I feel like I won the marriage lottery, like she is just incredible, and, and so, um, but you know, I, we, we, had, we try to have a date night like every single week, and so we had this date night, and, and so we were there at date night, is that Daniel, what's up Daniel? You want to move down here? Are you sure? You don't want to go back to, you can stay here and not go to high. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out, try it out. Um, and so we were on our date night, and, uh, and so we're there, and I had had what I felt was a particularly difficult week, right? Like, I, I was just feeling it, and my day had been really hard, and so, you know, I was there at the date night, and I got to be honest, I was sort of very in touch with my feelings and my emotions and, I, and my needs, because I'm a man, and I got needs, baby. And so I don't know what I was expecting, you know, maybe like, hey, oh, babe, I'm so sorry. Can I give you a back rub? You know, you want to just leave the restaurant now? We could go home and, you know, and I don't, I don't know what I, you know, and pray. I don't know, some of y'all have been pray in tongues. And, um, and so I was, you know, I was, and, and so I started sharing about my difficult week and my difficult day. And, and I did not feel like my wife was giving me the empathy that my soul needed. And quite frankly, I felt I deserved. And, um. And so, unbeknownst to me, Nancy had had a difficult week and had had a difficult day, and so she, she wanted the same level of comfort. Now, now I wish I could tell you, um, this is my one blooper reel and all my highland, highlight reels of being an amazing husband, but I'm a work in progress, and, um, and so she's telling me about this, and I got kind of frustrated, and I was just being really selfish, and, and so we're there, and in my head popped the words, 
babe, didn't you have off today for your job? Like, weren't you basically just home with Liam all day? Some of y'all, all your women are like, oh my God, how is he still alive? <laughs> and out of my mouth came the words, babe, didn't you have off today at your job? And as they're coming, I was like, oh God. I think by the end of the phrase, she was like, excuse me? I just laid on the floor. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> she was like, Do, have you been with an 18-month-old child all day? You think that's a vacation? They're like a little hurricane of mobility and activity just going all over the place. Why don't you? And I was just like, ah. <laughs> and it was amazing. You ever been there? Maybe not there, but like, you know what I'm talking about. And you just, Ben, I don't like you shaking your head like that, bro. So judgy. Gosh. See, words are powerful. Words are powerful. You ever been inspired by great words? You're like, right now, Pastor John, inspired. I don't know why y'all are laughing. You ever been changed by words? You ever been hurt by words? Like, we have this ridiculous phrase in our culture. I don't know who came up with this. You ever heard this? Sticks and stones might break my bones. What does it say? But words will never hurt me. Who came up with that? Tin man? Like, what in the world? Will words hurt you? Can somebody say, do words hurt you, yes or no? Yes. Words are powerful. Words are crucial. Words are important. See, words can and, and words do hurt us and wound us or inspire us to be fully us. I went to graduate school at the University of Florida, the premier educational institution in the state. Go Gators! Not that it's about that, but college football season is coming back, and I sense a good spirit on that. Let me tell you, I like a lot of this. I could get away with some of this, but some of that, repent. Some of y'all are like, you talk about sports a lot. If you think I talk about sports a lot, just wait until football season. Bless the Lord. But I remember I was there at the University of Florida. I got my master's degree in secondary education. And so for one of my classes, I had to do sort of a thesis that was a whole semester long. And it was on the impact of teacher expectations on student performance. I was not the first one to do this research, and I have not been the last. There was a good breadth of research, but I wanted to do it for myself. Sure enough, the findings have been overwhelmingly consistent. And the findings are this. People, students, humans will rise or fall to the level of expectations that you have for them. Did you know this? Like it is, you almost are creating a self-fulfilling prophecy with your words, which means this, and I need us to catch this, because although we might all say, oh, the sticks and stones thing, that's so ridiculous, I think some of us functionally live like that. And here's the problem with that. Your tongue is is doing more than really re reflecting a reality for your job or your ministry or your marriage or your family. Your words are creating a reality as well. Yeah. James says it like this. James says, so also the, to the tongue is a small net member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. So much for subtlety. He keeps going. For every beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Some of y'all are looking at your neighbor right now like, mm-hmm. Don't do that. They're going to cut you, all right? They, they, we need to hear this because, well, Proverbs says it like this. It says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. See, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will change your destiny. I'm going to coin that one. Ah. See, what happens is we are creating a reality with our words and with our tongue where we are either building up or tearing down. Look at what David says in Psalm 39, he goes on and he says, man, I was, I was mute and silent. I was, I was trying to hold my tongue. I was trying to hold back my words and, and I held my peace, but it was to no avail. My distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I couldn't help it, man. I just spoke with my tongue. You ever been there before? Like, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna say anything. You're hanging out with family members and it's amazing. And but you're like, oh man, this one person, you're hanging out with a friend, you've got that coworker and they just do that thing. And you're like, oh, hold your tongue. And then all of us, you just, you ever been there? It doesn't work, right? 
eventually your tongue is going to do its yabba dabba do thing whether you like it or not. Which is why I think the secret here and something that David is hitting on very honestly because God knows our frame is that David was not just focused on not saying the wrong things. Because what happens when all you try to do is not say the wrong things is it just starts boiling up inside. It's like shaking up a can of Coke. Like eventually, I thought about a sermon illustration and I was like, they'll kick us out of the school. So I didn't do that. But but eventually, you shake up this can of Coke. Eventually, what's going to happen? It's going to explode. See, guarding your words when it comes to guarding your life, guarding your words is not just about not saying the wrong things, but it is about learning to say the right things. Let me give an example. When I first got married, some of you, let's use the fellas for example. You first get married, man, it takes almost no effort at all. Your wife walks in the room, you're like, ooh, girl, I just, I, I think I just got touched by an angel. Your wife walks in and you're like, oh my goodness, girl, you are looking fine. My God, you get religious on it. You're like, my God, whew, I married somebody. You, you just, you, I mean, you are effusive with your words. You're like, girl, I hate to see you go, but I love to see you leave. Is that, is that too much? Did I, too much there? Married, I said married, okay, married people. But we go over the top, don't we? Like we just, we just go, we go crazy with stuff. We almost can't help ourselves in being effusive with our praise. Now, let me be clear. If you're doing this right, you are not just focusing on physical attributes, but the beauty and depth of character and godliness and amazing heart and, and, and attributes and, and all these different things of your spouse, right? That's all coming out. And, and you almost can't help yourself because you're so in touch with the gift of God that he's given you in this beautiful young lady sitting in the front row with the curly hair. You just want to sing, sweet lady. Okay, okay. So we are like, I'm going to pray for this pastor. I'll take it. But what happens? Because that doesn't last forever, does it? Some of y'all wives in here are like, nope. What happens? What changes? We get complacent. We... We get accustomed. We experience the same condition that is, that is throughout all of humanity. We sort of just get used to things. And what happens is we stop guarding our tongues. And all of a sudden, the things that were so easy to say in the right way, in the affirming way, in the encouraging way, in the building up, edifying way, they're said less and less. And the things that are said in the negative, tear down, destroy and destruct, come out easier and easier. And so the right words come out of our mouths less and less, and the wrong words find their way out of our mouths more and more. Ephesians says this. It says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for, what does it say here? Building others up according to their needs. See, when the tongue is not guarded and and you just sort of say whatever you want because you're like, John, man, it's a free country, and I'm just going to speak my mind. You know what that's called? Spirit of stupid right there. That is what descended on you in that moment. Because FYI, if you follow Jesus, it may be a free country, but we still bow to King Jesus. Amen? I I want us to think about this, church. Like, how how many times if you, if we, if I had not just said what you did and kept the guard on your mouth, would your marriage have been that much stronger? How many times if you wouldn't have just said that snarky comment to a coworker about your boss that eventually made it back to your boss, would you be in a better position for upward mobility? How many times if you wouldn't have yelled at their kids, would there be better communication and unity in your home? Church, guard your life by guarding your words because if you can guard your words, you will guard your life. Amen? Amen. Point number one. If you want to guard your life, if you want to be proactive in establishing a path towards your joy and flourishing, you need to guard your words. Point number two is this. You need to guard your ways. Guard your ways. Everybody say, guard them. I didn't make you talk to your neighbor. So introverts, I just threw you a bone, okay? You just had to say something. Guard your ways. Psalm 39 verse 4 says this. Oh, Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. See, we've got to realize that we are all getting sold hard on the idea of what it means to be successful every single day. 
Every single day, man, you need this car and, and you need this house and, and, and you need this occupation and you need this salary and you need this job and you need this kiki or this KB or this spouse or this significant other. You need, man, you need all of this stuff. And it's so common and it's so effective. It was even thrown at Jesus himself. Like Jesus himself is tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 and, and, and the, the enemy, the opponent of our souls, the devil, he comes to Jesus and he says things like, well, Jesus, I mean, if you're really the son of God, why don't you? And he takes a poke at his identity. And he takes a poke at his status and he takes a poke at his abilities. And, and he goes on and he says, hey, listen, man, all you got to do is this little thing and I'll give you the kingdoms of this world and all the power therein. And, and he takes a poke at his success. And I think we need to be honest to the fact that if this temptation were utilized by the opponent of our souls on Jesus himself, you better believe it's coming at you every chance he's got. I think we need to own up to the fact that, that while we might consider ourselves uh, very aloof and distant and we say, John, man, I, I'm not influenced by people around me. I'm not influenced by the voices around me. I'm just doing me. I'm doing my own thing, and I'm just doing whatever I want. You're actually not. Yeah. Cognitive psychology tells us that's false. The Bible tells us that's false. The reality of things is we are all creatures of imitation to one degree or another. See, what we know of the human experience is the fact that we are way more susceptible to outside voices than we'd like to admit, which is why God is very honest with us in saying the secret is to not getting so self-contained in and of yourself that you're like, man, I'm just doing whatever I want. No one impacts me. John Don said, no man is an island unto himself. We're all impacted by someone, which is why the secret is to get the right outside voices around you. David says in verse four, he says, God, make me know my end. Make me know my end. I think this is so important. David is realizing very humbly, God, I will get distracted. I will lose sight of the target. I will lose the end game. If I'm left to myself, I've got like spiritual ADD, God. I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna be all over the place. God, help me. Make me to know my end. Show me what a win looks like for my life, God. Like, show me. I can just do stuff. I can just stay busy. We can all do that, and that takes, that takes very little effort. But God, can you show me what I'm supposed to be investing in my life in. God, I need your vision for my life. Scripture says it like this, without a prophetic revelation, God's people perish. Without a prophetic vision, this is more than just busying yourselves with good stuff. This is saying, God, help me to see what it is that you've uniquely wired and gifted and destined me for. And now help me give myself for this. I, I mentioned briefly a few months ago, Joe Hernandez, he's one of the leaders in our church. He leads the setup and teardown team. He texted me this maybe half a year ago, almost a year ago now, and he said, hey, bro, I, I've just been praying. I've been climbing the corporate ladder at my job. I've been doing, doing really well. And I just kind of realized I'm climbing this ladder to success, and it's like up against the wrong wall. Very astute observation, he said. So I'm just done. I, I know I, I've been praying about this. I've been talking with my wife. I've been thinking about this. This isn't some haphazard decision. I know I, know I need to go a different direction. I love this. David is, David is saying here, he says, God, show me, let me know, help me know how fleeting I am in verse four. Because here's the reality that David experienced and that David was in touch with. If he doesn't let me know, I'll never get it. Like, if, if this is not just IQ here, this is revelation. This is not just intelligent here. David was arguably a very intelligent individual. He was a very capable organizational leader. He had one of the largest kingdoms that the ancient world had ever seen. But David, in the midst of all of his intellectual accolades, was in touch with the fact that like every CEO that regularly we hear about on their deathbed who goes, oh, in tears, I missed it. I should have spent more time with my family. I should have done more things. Listen, friends, I get that you can be intelligent and you can have your vision board with the next 10 years planned out. But, friend, I've got to let you know that if you are trusting in your own foresight and abilities to plan out your life, you are in danger of getting to the end and looking back with hindsight and saying, I missed it. I missed it. See, we need to guard our ways. It's way too easy to fall into wrong or sin or wickedness and end up shipwrecking our lives, but it is equally way too easy to end up spending our lives and our time and our energy and our passion for the wrong things and end up wasting our lives as well. 
Colossians 3 says this. It says, set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. We're about to start a sermon series in the fall. We're taking like six to eight weeks, and we're just going through Colossians 3, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Paul says, hey, set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. Why? Because you died. The old you that used to do the stuff that you wanted to do, and you realized, man, this is horrible. I'm getting the stuff, and it's still not working. Yeah, that person, he died, and, and now you're seated with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. I want to challenge us as a faith family. I want to challenge us as a spiritual family, a church family, with this question. When is the last time that we, that you, that I, that we ask God, God, how do you want me to be? God, how do you want me to be a blessing and serve people with the gifts and talents you've given me? God, how do you want me to spend the money you've blessed me with? Because I know you've blessed me to be a blessing. How do you want me to spend my life? Vision boards are good, and 10-year plans are great, and 15-year plans are even better. I don't know how you even do that with this changing world, but, but there's nothing wrong with vision. But can I submit to you that vision is good, but revelation is better? And church, we've got to realize and acknowledge that in a world with a current like ours where we are predisposed towards busyness and seeing busyness and productivity as effectiveness only to be thoroughly disappointed in the end road, we all need an outside force who sees the bigger picture better than we do. Church, we need to guard our ways. I dare you, I challenge you to ask God this week. If you're taking notes, I would write this question down specifically. I'm serious. I, I would love it. I would be thrilled if all of us would ask God this week this question. Lord, I even put it up here on the screen so you could copy it down. Lord, are there things you want me doing with my time that I'm not doing yet? Super practical here. John, what do I do with this message? This week, ask this question as often as it takes to get an answer. God, are there things you want me doing with my time that I'm not doing yet? And conversely, is there anything that I need to stop doing that is wasting my time? Like, wouldn't you love it if someone knew the future and they could come back from the future and they're fast forwarding and they could tell you, hey, listen, I know this seems great. Waste of time. Don't even do it. Hey, I know this seems like it's not that important. This will change your life. Keep doing it. Wouldn't that be amazing? Guess who can do that? That's always the right answer in church, right? Jesus, yes, God, because he exists outside of time and space. Maybe you're on the right track. Maybe the answer you hear is, hey, son, daughter, keep going. You're doing a great job. That's amazing. Then stay on that path, and what do you think you need to do with it? Guard it. Guard it. Do more of it. Yeah, because all we like sheep, and we drift, and we go astray. Personally, I want to be investing my life in the things that God knows I was created for. We had staff prayer as a church with some of our church staff. This week, we were praying, God, we don't just want to do good things. We don't just want to do cool things. We don't just want to do relevant things. God, show us the things you want us to do, and we'll drop everything else. As a church, as individuals, Lord, show us where you want us stepping out in faith. Give us the courage to step out. Nudge us when we start to drift in the wrong lanes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Point number three. Point number three, if you want to guard your life, you need to guard your weight. W-A-I-T. All right, don't get, don't get that twisted. I was talking to my mom. She's like, what are you preaching on? They're on their way to Israel for a mission trip. And I was like, oh, I'm preaching on guarding your weight. She's like, excuse me? I was like, W-A-I-T. Okay. Almost got killed again. The other point is guard your words. So guarding your weight. David says this in verse 7. He says, and now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. See, everybody's waiting for something. Everybody's hoping for something. Everybody's putting their hopes in something. Now, I want to articulate something that I think is important if you want to do this and thrive for the long haul. There are what I call micro hopes and ultimate hope. Okay, so when it comes to the micro hopes, these are things that are gifts from God that are good and, and, and not evil in any sort of way. These are things like hobbies and sports, come on somebody, and, and activities and spending time with your family and, and recreation and vacations. These are all things that are good and necessary to our constitution if you want to survive and thrive for the long haul. If you're not already doing this, Sabbath and rest and celebrate and enjoy the life and the blessings that God has given you. If you have not already implemented these micro hopes in your life, you need to do that. 
But if all you're living for are these earth hopes, these micro hopes, these, these things from earth, things from earth can never satisfy desires that God has placed in us that exist outside of this earth. And so see, what your soul needs is an ultimate hope. What your soul needs is an ultimate hope, and you need and we need to guard this. People, stuff, vacation, sports, they all make great micro hopes, temporary, released from the craziness and the busyness of life, and by all means, church, do those things. But they will ultimately fall short and never truly satisfy. Why? Because your soul has a craving that only God can fulfill. David gets this. He's like, God, for what does my soul wait? My hope is in you. See, friends, we need God. It's a great question to be asking, for what does my soul wait? What is my soul longing for? Because all too often we, ha we can identify that thing and some of the greatest tragedies come when we get that thing and realize I am more miserable now than I even was before. You need to guard your weight. But see, here's another reason why we need to guard it, because oftentimes, even if our hope and our weight is in God, how many of you know God's timing is not always our timing? Come on. And so the danger is because we, we very much are in touch with the way that we think things should go down to, to make the best. And so we try to give God like our, our, our godly advice. We're like, hey, Lord, I'm and I was just thinking, if you could do this right now, that would be, you know, like ideal. And so when God doesn't take our advice, if we're not careful, we get bitter. We get angry. We get disillusioned. We get jaded. We lose hope. But the scripture encourages us that, that those who trust in the Lord, those who put their hope in God, are never put to shame. This is what David writes in Psalm 25. And I want to speak to you. Some of you are here and, and you've been let down. You've been jaded. You've been disappointed by people. And I, I've got to say, I'm so sorry. Welcome to humanity. Like, it's probably everybody in this room in some ways. But it's possible that some earth stuff might have slipped into your ultimate hope bin. Can I encourage you? Take it out. Because it will never fully satisfy some of you are looking for hope and, and beginning to grow weary in the waiting. Can I encourage you with the reality of Scripture? God will come through. God has not forgotten you. God is near. God is present. God is able. God is wise. Some of the things in retrospect that you thought you really needed right then, you look back and you're like, thank you, Jesus. You did not give that to me because that would have destroyed me. God is not aloof. God is not distant. I can't give you all the rationale as to why that sickness happened and hasn't been healed, why that job was lost and hasn't been recovered, why that income went away and hasn't been. I can't give you any of that. What I can tell you definitively is God is not caught by surprise. And if you belong to him, he is with you. And those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. He said, John, what do you want me to do this week? I want you to guard your words and guard your weight and guard your ways. I want you to guard your life. This week, I want you, I want us to get a gear for guarding our lives. You say, John, I feel like God's really doing some stuff in my heart. We've had, I think, six people in the past month that have gotten baptized in micro churches and on Sundays. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's like, man, God, you're doing like real legitimate, awesome life change. Can I say to you, if you're like, John, I feel like I'm in the best place spiritually I've ever been. Man, I'm so thrilled. Guard that. Guard that. Because if you guard it, there's a possibility you might not have to look back and say, man, I had it all and I blew it. That doesn't have to be your story. When you get on the right track, don't take it for granted. Guard it. When you guard the alignment, guard the momentum, guard the presence, guard the desire, guard the heart with all diligence. Proverbs says, be on your guard. Be wise with your words and your ways and your weight. You say, John, but this is difficult. This is hard. This is, man, have you tried this? Yes. And I've told you some of my blooper reels. 
See, this gets even more difficult because if it was just up to our own ability, that would be one thing because we all have a high level of ineptitude at different points when it comes to spiritual growth and formation. But the difficult reality here is it's not even just that we're playing bad offense. We actually have a very aggressive opponent to our souls who is looking and scheming for ways to steal and kill and destroy us. Did you know this? You say, John, man, I'm... This is good and and this is helpful and thanks for bringing this up and and maybe I can do this in the good times. Maybe I can do this when, when stuff is going well and when things are working out and when things are easy. But when I get overwhelmed, when life gets stressful, when the kids aren't sleeping and I'm I'm walking around like the walking dead, in my own strength, I am constantly prone to let down my guard, which is the beauty of the gospel. This is the beauty of the good news of Jesus. The worship team can get ready. We're gonna close in a final song in just a moment, but I love how David ends this this sort of section of Psalm 39. Here at Greenhouse, we're passionate about Jesus. We love Jesus. He's the hero of every single story. Why? Because he is the hero of every single story. David ends all of this and he says, man, I'm resolute. I'm going to guard my ways. I'm going to put a muzzle on my mouth. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to speak. He, he's so passionately resolved. And yet in verse 7, David acknowledges a reality that all of us would be wise to acknowledge. He says, but God, what am I waiting for? Oh, my hope is in you. All of us, I'm sure, have experienced a reality where we've been hoping and waiting on our own abilities, on our own resolve, on our own self-effort to deliver. And if you wait on that long enough, it always breaks down, which is the beauty of the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which is this, when we were too weak and too distracted to guard ourselves, Jesus covered us. It's like every movie where where you're watching it and there's a hero and and in this moment they they are watching and they see the bullet that's being fired and their unsuspecting victim doesn't see it and so they jump in front of it and they take it and and what's up with that being such an almost overwhelmingly recurring theme of every action movie? It's because something in us realizes, man, ah, that's it. That's it. Like that's, that's what life is supposed to be about. And in exactly the same way, out of our own design and making, we stepped into the path of a bullet that we deserved called destruction from the sin, death, and rebellion that we had brought on ourselves. And in a moment of ultimate love and self-sacrifice, Jesus looks down and literally, proverbially, metaphorically steps in and takes the bullet that we deserved for the sin and punishment. And it's by his grace and because of his sacrifice that our eternal salvation has been guarded for eternity. You're like, John, I want to guard my life. I'm going to try really hard, but I know I'm going to fail. This is the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of atonement, the beauty of God's covering. Friends, here's the beautiful reality. He's already covered you. Your eternal destiny, if you have been covered by the grace of God and covered by Jesus, has been covered for eternity and his power and his grace, Titus says, teaches us to say no to the ungodliness and to guard our ways in this life as well. Would you join me in prayer? Just bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment of quiet and privacy before God. If if you're here and just really have a sense this morning as we were praying that there's some of you here and you've been considering Jesus and investigating Jesus and maybe during the course of the past few weeks, months, maybe even just today, there's something in you that says, I I need this. I've been trying to do things on my own. I've been trying to guard my life the best way I know how. And I keep, I keep running into roadblock after roadblock after pitfall after pitfall. And I'm just tired. I can't do this anymore. You're at the place where a lot of us have already been, which is a place of surrender. And for any who are humble enough to acknowledge that they need Jesus and they can't fix themselves and they can't save themselves, Jesus offers new life. Jesus offers a new heart, a fresh start, a renewed mind for any who are willing and humble enough to surrender, to place their trust in him. 
you're here, you need to place your trust in Jesus to be guarded from the consequences of the sin and rebellion in your life. Scripture says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own, to our own way. And you wanna receive the forgiveness only found in Jesus. I wanna give you a chance to respond right now. If that's you, you say, John, you're talking to me. I, I, I'm hearing you. I need to respond right now. I wanna become a follower of Jesus. I wanna place my trust in Jesus. I need the forgiveness that only he offers. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to just shoot your hand up in the air and wave it at me. There's nothing magical about this, but I think there's something powerful about acknowledging with your hand what God is doing on the inside right now in your heart. It seems to make it more real to you. So if that's you, you say, John, I want to trust in Jesus. On the count of three, you can just shoot your hand up in the air and wave it at me. One, two, three. Awesome. 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 You can put it right back down. Even right there in your chair, I'd encourage you to begin the dialogue with God. Say, Jesus, I'm listening. You've got my attention. I can't do this on my own anymore. I want to trust in you. I want to surrender to you. I want to follow you. Forgive me. Teach me. Train me to guard my ways, to guard my tongue, to guard my way. I need you. Maybe you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus. You've begun a relationship with God through Jesus, but but you know you need to recommit to guarding your life. You know there's areas of your words or your ways or your weight where you have started to drift off the path. Can I encourage you? The process is very simple. It's called repentance. It's called changing your mind, which changes your direction, saying, Jesus, I know I've been haphazard in this area of my life. I'm done with it. I'm sorry. I repent. And he welcomes you right back. So let's stand to our feet as we get ready. If I could get our prayer partners and our altar workers up here at the front, if you raised your hand, or maybe you did it, but you know God is working on you in a specific area, I would encourage you, uh, as, as soon as we begin to sing, why don't you come up and receive prayer? Our prayer partners, some of our microchurch leaders up here are, would love to pray with you and agree with you about some next steps in your faith journey. You don't have to walk this alone. One of the best ways, by the way, that you can begin guarding your ways is to get in a community with people who are trying to walk the same path that you are. And you can start that right now this morning. So Jamie and the team, why don't you guys lead us in this final chorus? Ijelet, why don't you lead us in this final chorus?